Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for this conference and for my presentation. I really appreciate seeing you all here. Um, so my name is Alyssa Freeman. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan, where I'm studying piano pedagogy and performance. I'm also student staff at the Office of Diversity, and Equity and Inclusion at the School of Music, Theater and Dance. And I am going to be presenting today on a topic that I've been researching for several years now, um, the works of classical era women composers. So today, I will give a quick introduction and historical inter overview of um, uh, what it meant to be a, a woman in the classical era, um, a woman composer, I should say. And then I will play a Maria Hester Park Sonata in C major, opus seven, I will also play Josepha Barbara Aurenhammer's set of variations, and I will give a bit of an overview of the, her classical project, which is the topic of my dissertation. Goals of today are that we will gain familiarity with the classical era women composers and their music, consider the history of their music and why much of it has faded into obscurity, and understand some of the available tools and resources for teaching and playing this music. So first of all, in way of introduction, let's take a look at our current trends for women as composers. According to a recent study by the Dawn Women in Music, among 1,446 concerts across the world in 2018 and 19, only 76 included a piece written by a woman composer. Within a survey of 47 college music history textbooks, 25% failed to mention a single woman composer, and only 0.02% of the musical excerpts were written by women. More specifically to piano or keyboard world, the Royal Conservatory of Music curriculum, one of the most commonly taught methods for pre-college students, does not contain a single work by women from the Baroque or classical eras in any of its levels. So, let's take a look at history now. <laughs> so, first of all, it's important to recognize that there are some regional trends here and differences in Europe during the classical era, which I'm going to focus on. So, my uh, research has mainly focused on the English and the Austro-German traditions, and they're very different from one another, especially in terms of women's roles in music and mobility in terms of what they were able to do with success, with social approval, right? All of those things. So in England at the time, it was a little bit more common for women to actually be able to compose music that they might even sell to their students. Many women were thinking of music as a business and even supporting families off of their music sales and their teaching. However, in the Austro-German tradition, this was not nearly as common, and it was very, very uncommon for women to publish their works. Uh, but they were very often performing their works, especially if they were nobility. Um, they would often be very, very virtuosic works, which I will be playing one of today. <laughs> um, so women participating in music was often tied to their social status and their marriage ability. Um, one quote that is important in the social commentary on women composers during this time by Rousseau, who influenced a lot of thought in Europe, um, says there are no good morals for a woman outside of a withdrawn and domestic life. The peaceful care of the family and the home are the lot. So prevailing views well into the 19th century as well were that women were meant to be passive and submissive. Again, this was less true for England at the time, probably in part due to the popularity of English keyboards rising and more women owning instruments in the upper class. Also, there were more concerts that were happening amongst the upper class, not just nobility. So these are some important differences. I also will mention here that there's also an entirely other tradition that I'm not going to be speaking very much of um, that was very important at this time, French and Parisian life. Of course, Paris was one of the three major cities at this time, Paris, London, and Vienna were all rising. So my research is not focused as much on that, but I wanted to mention that. 
So one of the composers that I will be talking about is Josefa Barbara Auernhammer. These are her dates, um, 1758 through 1820. Uh, musicologist Michael Lorenz, who some of you may know has uh, done some excellent research on Mozart and his students, and he has uh, uncovered some of the misrepresentations of Auernhammer's life. Um, for example, uh, the Jahrbuch, uh, Jahrbuch by Mozart, um, or of Mozart, sorry, uh, considered her of noble birth, but she was not. Uh, and she was said to be an only child, whereas she was actually one of 15. Uh, eight died young, though. And this is just one example of women being misrepresented in slight ways, seemingly small ways, but over time it adds up and we forget them. Her mother um, also may have inherited some money that enabled Auernhammer to, uh, to pursue music. Because as you can see, she was born in Vienna, died in Vienna. So the fact that she was not of nobility makes her a very exceptional woman to be a virtuoso pianist, to be connected to Mozart, right? She was really Mozart's star pupil. And I have to talk about Mozart because I'm going to be performing a piece that is a set of variations on one of Mozart's arias. Um, so they had an interesting relationship. Uh, they, were, they were close friends in a lot of ways, and then they were also uh, fellow musicians. They performed together frequently. Mozart taught her. And Mozart, very unkindly, some of you may know, wrote that Auernhammer had the face of the devil, and there were rumors at that time that Mozart and Auernhammer would marry, so he may have been trying to distance himself a bit, but I love Auernhammer's response. She says, I am not beautiful, au contraire, I am ugly, and I don't want to marry some petty clerk in the chancellery. I'd rather stay single and make a living off my talents. I love that she thought she could do that. Unfortunately, she did not completely get to live up to that. That was not very easy at the time, um, but I she definitely had the, uh, the skills. So, a little bit about this piece. Six variations on the aria, Der Vogelfinger bin ich ja. And I will be playing this, uh, it's a, based on a well-known aria sung by Papageno in the Magic Flute. It's jolly and comedic in character. And the translation of the text is, text is about how Papageno is well-known throughout the lands of Birdcatcher. Um, and the characteristic five note ascending scale is the flute being piped to lower the birds. So uh, I'll go ahead and play this. And as you listen, listen for Auernhammer's take on this piece, especially the way that she captures the lighthearted character of this. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as you can tell, lots of figuration. She was definitely a pianist and writing for herself. <laughs> so now we'll turn to Maria Hester Park, married named Reynolds. And her dates are 1760 to 1813, born England, city unknown, and died in Hampstead. Though the first, the first concert that she gave was in the Oxford area, so she may have lived in that area. Prominent teacher, much of her music was published by the author. So this is kind of what I was talking about before. In England, women were sometimes, uh, actually, there's several examples of women who were writing music and contacting publishers to have their music produced and sold. And this was likely because they had enough demand as a teacher that their students were requesting their music be published. So uh, Maria Hester Park was one of those uh, composers in England who was doing that. And uh, one thing that's important to recognize with her, is that, uh, as opposed to some others, is that Park was writing especially for uh, skilled amateurs. So. Uh, if I had time, I would show you some pieces by Jane Savage, which are a little bit more um, on the other side of things, where they were definitely more pedagogical and stepping stones um, into some larger pieces. So she was a composer, pianist, vocalist, a mother of five, and she had quite a large output, especially for a woman of this time. Um, this quote by Diana Ambach, who has been a champion of Maria Hester Park's works, I think fits really perfectly. It says, Park made her living composing the sort of music performed by Jane Austen heroines. And uh, this is probably really true. <laughs> um, she was probably teaching a lot of these women at the, the same era. Um, I think that if I could contact BBC and have the next film accompanied by the music of my choice, it would be Maria Hester Parks for sure. Um, so she was writing for skilled amateurs, uh, and then she had a relationship with Franz Joseph Haydn uh, through her husband Thomas Park, especially, um, who was a very good friend of Haydn's. So I will be playing her sonata in C major, opus 7. This is uh, slightly different from the program notes. Um, Rondo Alleg Allegramente, uh, the third movement. So the, uh, ref or, yeah, sorry, the refrain of this um, rondo it's very melodic and sweet. It's accompanied in thirds, which is very characteristic of Park's writing. And then the first episode is virtuosic, brilliant, still in C major, and has lots of left-hand scales. Um, and then the second episode is much more of a Sturm und Drang character. It's in A minor. Um, and I think that's everything. So I hope you enjoy listening to Maria Hester Park's Sonata in C major, the seven.
so much. So this all is part of a project that I've been building called HerClassical.com, and I wanted to invite you all to check this resource out. Um, my goal in creating this resource was to make more of this music more accessible as much of it is only available, was only available in um, its first edition from the 1700s or, um, or in just a manuscript form. So um, I have categorized music both by composer and also by level. As you can see, the levels range now from early intermediate to advanced pieces. Um, and I have videos and other teaching resources online. It's all available for free. And I would invite you to start teaching these pieces in your own studios or performing these on your own stages. And um, I wanted to close with a question that I was recently asked by someone who approached me about my research. Um, they said, do you really think that anything a woman wrote could actually replace the great canonic works we study? And I hope that if nothing else, I'm leaving you with the message that yes, I very much do think that they can and should. <laughs> and um, these are my sources. If you would like any of them, please let me know and I would be happy to talk to you.